Hello everyone and welcome to our Tuesday live stream. Our guest today is one of the most sought after acting coaches in all of Los Angeles. During his 30 year teaching career, he has taught thousands of actors, including Hollywood stars such as Will Smith, Brad Pitt, Gal Gadot, and Salma Hayek, many more. Recently, he's been teaching online courses in audition technique, his eight steps, monologue work, and even a six week version of his foundation course. We are thrilled to have him here today with us. Please welcome Howard Fine. Hi. Hey, Howard. I'll try to live up to that introduction. Tommy. Yeah. I try, I try to give you the best intro I can. Um, yeah. So um, right at the top, what's really interesting to me is um, how you actually became um, an acting coach and how you got to be so popular. So can you give us a little background uh, about your background in the industry and how you sure. came to be such a popular acting coach? Well, it, some luck and hopefully some skill uh, and they mixed together. Uh, it actually all started in high school when German and French met at the same time and I had to choose something else and I chose introduction to theater, which I thought was going to be a history class. Yeah. And I walked in and they were doing improvs and I had a high school drama coach who knew Uta Hagen's work. He, he could have been anywhere at any college, but he happened to be at a high school. And I was lucky to have three years with him. And he put me in productions as an actor, but he spotted a potential directing talent. And he gave me my first play to direct when I was 16, Edward Albee's The Sandbox. Oh, wow. And then I, by the time I went to college, I knew that my stronger skill was as a director and potentially teacher, although I had to study as an actor. And then same through graduate school, went to New York. Uh, they gave me the worst class the school had ever had to start with. I turned them around. And then I moved to New York in 1985. I was teaching in my living room and I got a job teaching at the Tracy Roberts Actor Studio. And an agent came to watch a class there to see an actor. She didn't care for the actor, but she thought I was good. And she was representing Paul Stanley, the lead singer of the rock band Kiss. Right. He was looking for an acting coach. So I'm in my living room. He pulls up in his convertible Porsche. <laughs> he brings the same audition material to the top three coaches in L.A. and me. And I'm brand new off the truck. And so he had all the coaches work with him. And when I got done, he said, hands down, you're the guy. Wow. The next week he went to the audition and the director stopped him and said, that was amazing. Who are you studying with? And he said, well, this new guy, Howard Fine. Well, that's all Paul needed to hear. <laughs> and then the following week he invited me to his bowling birthday party. <laughs> and I was bowling with all the members of the Brat Pack at the time Robert Downey Jr., Sarah Jessica Parker, Judd Nelson. Oh. And suddenly I'm hanging out and I'm the celebrity acting coach. <laughs> so that's how it occurred. And it went from one to another to another. I would have never guessed that it started with Kiss. That's, uh... It started with Kiss. My first celebrity <laughs> student in L.A. was Paul Stanley of Kiss. That is awesome. Yeah. Um, so you wrote a book called Fine on Acting, uh, Vision of the Craft. It's a great book uh, if anyone wants to check that out. And you have a whole section dedicated to common mistakes that actors make, which is great because as we've talked about in previous um, live streams, that actors go in for the audition, they think they did an okay job or they think they did a great job, nailed it. They get no feedback, they don't book, and they're left wondering what they could have done differently in the room. So in absence of casting director feedback, which is really hard to get, um, you can use this advice to self-evaluate, right? Yes. Um, so wanted to go through some of the points that you have on, on that part of your book regarding um, common mistakes. So one of the things you talk about is you've said the why versus the how is fundamental to your teaching. Can you explain what you mean by that? Yes. In life, we start with thoughts and feelings, and then we find the words to express those thoughts and feelings. That's why language was invented, to express our wishes. In acting, we start with the words. What should we do? Back up, 
and find the thoughts and feelings that make us need to say these words. That's why. What's the acting mistake, including a great deal of training, unfortunately? How? How should I play this moment? How should I make this work? If you supply the why, the how takes care of itself. Now, actors are forever getting the advice. I, I have what I call the, the greatest hits of general acting notes. Mm -hmm. And one of the greatest hits is, well, you need levels, you need colors, you need to make a strong choice. And the actor thinks a strong choice is something they have to figure out and impose on the material. A strong choice is authentic connection and investment. So if it were baseball, the outfielder is running after the ball with the intent to catch it. Whatever he does with his body to make that happen is because he wants to catch the ball. He supplies the why. Now, if you're an actor and you're thinking about it the wrong way, you're thinking, okay, leap on my left foot, extend my right hand. Oh, that'll be a strong choice. No, it's not something imposed. It comes from the need within the scene. So when you make a strong choice, you brought yourself authentically and invested yourself into the circumstances. That's great. And uh, you talk a little bit about judging the character. So yeah. what does that mean? It means you've separated yourself. You don't see yourself in the character. When I work with any actors, I start with step number one of my eight steps, which is who am I? Not who is she? Who is he? Right. Who am I? And so judging a character is the easiest acting trap to fall into. It takes no talent to judge a character. Anyone can do it. Everyone does. Your talent comes in when you justify the character. Think of Meryl Streep in Devil Wears Prada. Did she play a nasty woman? No, she played a woman who's trying to toughen these girls up for their own good. She didn't judge the character. And so actors do not spend any time on how you are different than a role. That's a dead end. And actors do that all the time. Oh, this isn't me. Yes, it is. If you look at a role and you say, that's not me, there's a part of yourself you don't see. So in order to not judge a character, I have to own my full range of behaviors and know that anything a human being is capable of, I am capable of. So the operative question, actors, is not what would I do, but what would make me do this? And you better find where that would live inside you. No, that's great because uh, you know so often you'll see someone playing a uh, part, and you're like, they, it doesn't have any heart to it. Like you, uh, you know, it, right? Look, look at Breaking Bad and how brilliant Cranston's performance is in that. We care about him, even though he's doing horrendous things right because there's a human being there a dimensional human being so we never decide who's the antagonist and who's the protagonist right no one's the villain everyone is the hero of their own stories as they are in our own life we feel justified in anything we do uh, Forrest Whitaker as Idi Amin found a human being in Last King of Scotland he didn't play a bad guy. Right. That's what wins you an Oscar. That's genius level acting. But you only get that if you truly know yourself, if you don't distance yourself from the character. And for heaven's sake, do not psychoanalyze the character. That will create more and more gap between your soul and the soul you're trying to inhabit. Uh, that's great. Uh, you also talk about um, playing an idea. So what does it mean when an actor is playing an idea? Can you give an example of what that looks yes. like? Yes. So you get an idea for how, it goes back to how versus why, how you're going to play the scene. Again, it's actors thinking that choices are these things that we prefigure out and then all work out in advance. So I'm playing an arrogant agent who's going to be incredibly demanding and and then there's no human being. So you've got an idea of how you're going to play something rather than being authentic, being human, being real. 
Yeah, so that goes hand in hand, playing the idea and judging the character. So it all goes back to why versus how. Yeah, and um, you also talk about pre-shaping. Um, yeah. So what is that? Is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know what that is. So I, no, I, I love it. <laughs> okay. Okay. When you pre-shape, you stick something dead into your work because you cannot have impulses if you pre-plan them. Acting technique is not a roadmap of the performance. Acting technique prepares you to act. So let's use a tennis match as an example. In advance of the match, you practice your strokes, your backhand, your forehand, your serve. And then you have to go play the game, the match that's coming at you. If the ball is hit to the left side of the court, you can't run to the right side because you already pre-planned that. Pre-shaping is planning out the entire match in, in advance of it happening. So no matter what the other actor does, I'm not available to receive their impulse or descend impulse. I've worked out how I'm going to play everything. And there are people who teach acting that way. And I compare it to being taught paint by numbers. <laughs> it right. takes all the fear out because you've got it all figured out. But you're not going to create a masterpiece that way. So in all the work that we learn, it's who am I? Where did I just come from? What are my relationships? What personalizations do I have for this? What's going on in the scene? Who am I talking to? What do I want? And then I have to let go and moment to moment play what's really happening. But when I use my technique as a defense against spontaneous life, that's what pre-shaping is. There can be no spontaneity because no matter what you do, I have figured out everything I'm going to play. Yeah, and then it can come off as stiff and unnatural. It is. Yeah. It's dead on arrival. Yeah. That, because people pre-shape, they think incorrectly that they can over-rehearse. Can you imagine a sports team saying, hey, let's not practice before the Super Bowl. Let's be spontaneous. <laughs> and yet there's so many actors who think, oh, I don't want to run it too much. If you could run it too much and it would go stale, what would happen to a Broadway show after a week? Right. No. It would be horrendous. Yeah. Well, what happens instead? Six months into a run and the actors are doing their best work because they don't have to think about the lines, the blocking, the tech. They can now let go and be fully present in the moment. So there's no such thing. You can't over rehearse, but you can incorrectly rehearse. If you're incorrect and you're rehearsing, you've set it, you're running it, you set it and run it and you think, oh, I don't want to do that again. It's the reason athletes don't tire of playing their sport, because you do all the prep, but then it's new every single time. And that's what we want in scene work. You're still the same person with the same objectives, with the same words to say, but moment to moment, there's a slight variation. And that's what you have to allow. I love the sports analogies, by the way. It really it, it hits home. So I, I, Because basic scene work yeah. is basic sports. Yeah. Two forces in opposition, both wanting different things, who will win. Right. It's basic sports is basic scene work. You, and you often hear um, that this actor is very natural or this actor is very real. Is that the same thing? No. <laughs> real encompasses all human behavior if you just got the best news of your life right you have mm -hmm. just been awarded the prize for casting and journalism and whatever you might scream would that be less than real no because it's filled it's motivated so real means it's the full range of human behavior from subtle to overt Natural is a pre-shaped, mumbly attitude. I'm trying to be natural. And there is an entire school of what I call mumble acting, which is so awful. I, I've had to turn on subtitles sometimes for something that's in English <laughs> because the actors are mumbling. It drives sound people crazy. And there's nothing real about mumbling. You're playing an attitude of being natural. So being real means everything on the human spectrum is possible. Think young Jack Nicholson. He wasn't being natural, he was being alive. And so it's so much about what an animal has. Anything's possible. That's why we wanna watch an animal. 
or a baby in a scene because it's unpredictable. But when an actor is in the mumble thing, and yeah, wow, well, <laughs> I think, oh my God, open your mouth <laughs> and use the words. We don't sit at the dinner table that way. No one sits there going, cast me a roll. <laughs> You open your mouth when you want something. I say to my students, if you think people are casual, stand in line at a coffee shop and listen to the way that people order. Boy, there's nothing casual about. I'll have a half decal. <laughs> they know what they want and the way they want it. And boy, people suddenly open their mouths when they have a strong intent. Yeah, and an actor can have different types of energy that they bring to a role. Um, so one of the things that you talk about is having intelligent energy. Um, so maybe yes, elaborate the, the on that a little bit. Trying, it's actually a bad thing. Yeah. <laughs> the, the actor is trying to read the line intelligently. Yeah. As opposed to supplying what you really want, what it's really about. So if I'm <laughs> reading with intelligent energy, I might have the line, I love you, but I hate you. The actor who's on the top level of the lines does this. I love you, but I hate you. They're <laughs> trying to manufacture what they think the line tells them to do. Rather than seeing the words as clues to circumstance, the majority of how we feel and what we feel, we don't say. Every scene exists in what's not said not in what's said. So in intelligent energy, the actor is simply trying to read lines well, rather than supplying the inner life that's below the words. So you've got to think, what do I want to say that I never say? Because we edit ourselves constantly and we are selective in what we want to share. And so much is under the surface. Benicio del Toro kept cutting his lines in Sicario how many actors are smart enough to actually cut their dialogue? <laughs> because he knew he could convey so much more by being simple and by filling in his inner life. Sometimes an actor can be indicating. What is indicating? And how do you know when an actor is doing this? When you're indicating, there's a gap between <laughs> motivation and execution. So you are not supplying, again, the why, the inner life. You are pushing for something that's not really happening. So let's say uh, I just got a big job and my words are yes, <laughs> three exclamation points afterward, right? And I do this, yes! <laughs> and you go, oh, that's too big. It's not that it's too big. It's that I didn't supply any of the feeling that made me need to do that. So we spot indicating when there's no motivation behind the words. I'm simply pushing for something that I don't feel. And there are bad performances and bad actors where the actors are indicating. And can you talk about what it means when an actor is heading for the problem? Yes. We spend the majority of our lives trying to avoid conflict. If everybody in the audience thinks for a second about at least one person in your life that you would love to say certain things to, <laughs> that to this day, you've never been able to say them. What stops us? We don't want to lose the relationship. We're afraid of the consequences. So when the relationship is important, it's not so easy to fight. Otherwise, brush off choices. Watching two people hating on each other is totally uninteresting. If the other person matters to you, their feelings matter to you. So we try to avoid the problem for as long as we can until it happens. So you don't start a scene preparing for the big moment. You prepare for the first moment. Most of the fights in our lives come out of left field. We don't see them coming. So we could be in the middle of, good morning, how'd you sleep? And we're having that conversation. And a second later, I said, did you go to the grocery store? What do you mean you didn't go? Why didn't you go? 
And a second later, it's World War III about, I'm sick of your excuses, right? But we don't begin that way. We don't start heading for the problem. We hope the problem will never occur. So when you start a scene, you can't get ahead of it. You have to start preparing for the first moment, not the big moment. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of us in quarantine have had those uh, situations in real life where it's, uh, I'm trying to <laughs> I avoid... my dog so the conflict is not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> trying to avoid the situation, but eventually it's going to blow up. But that's great because it, it goes back to just, you know, giving that character heart and, you know, that person cares about that other person. They care about their relationship and... But sometimes... So you're picking it all up, Tommy. You yeah. see, none of these things are acting tricks. They're not rules for how you do scenes well. It's understanding human behavior. Past a certain point of acting technique, <coughs> it's all about understanding human behavior, our own and others as well. So right, and think how much more tension there is when we don't head for the tension. Yeah. As you try to keep a lid on that boiling pot for as long as you can, it doesn't mean it never boils over. But there's so much more tension when you're trying to restrain it. The minute we head for the full tension, it's released. It's over. It's done. So the more you try not to have the fight, the more we can feel it brewing and brewing and <laughs> brewing. One of my uh, quarantine binges has been Downton Abbey. I finally yeah. have sat down to watch it. And boy, you watch Maggie Smith work. <laughs> And yeah. there is, there's some great work between Maggie Smith and Shirley MacLaine, two veteran, brilliant actresses. And in lesser hands, they would be playing bitchy at each other. But instead, they're saying things so nicely yeah, with kindness. And boy, can you feel the edge and the animosity under it. They never head for it deliberately. Just mastercraft acting. Yeah, I've been uh, watching a lot of Ozark, which I know a lot of people have, and and that relationship just reminds me of the same thing, where just you can feel that tension, and it's just so interesting to watch, and it's just uh, I love it. And they don't exactly hate each other, right? No, it's more complicated <laughs> than that. Yeah. Um, so, what about playing the importance? What does that mean? It means we are. When we tell stories that are already true, we don't have to make them be true. We're free to be irreverent. So you might tell a story about something really traumatic that happened to you. And as you share that story, it's rather matter of fact, because the person who lived it does not want to re-experience the pain of it as they're telling it. They're actually trying to avoid it. The actor picks up the material and thinks they're not doing it just justice until they feel every bit of the pain. And so now they're making it very, very important. And it's akin to when you meet somebody who does nothing but complain, they do not evoke our sympathy. It's always the human being who's trying to be all right in the face of adversity that affects us. Never the person sitting in the pain. And years ago at the Jamaican Film Festival, I gave uh, an assignment, write the most tragic thing that's ever happened to you and the funniest thing. And they had to be true stories. So the first two days, everybody shared their own story. At the end of the second day, you had to take someone else's story. And on the third day, you had to make that story your own. But you'd already heard the real person tell it. And some of the local Jamaican women who weren't even actors <laughs> They took the class just as a lark. They shared stories that would give you chills of some of the things that happened to them. Absolutely matter of fact, because the truth is already true. We don't have to make the truth be true. And then on the third day, because you had heard the real person tell the story, you wanted to do it justice. You saw how simple they were because they were telling the truth. So we tend to give weight to the most mundane things. Look at all the postings of food on Facebook, <laughs> right? So you yep. tell a story. Oh, I had an asparagus the other night. Crispy, fresh, but my life is awful and I'm gonna kill myself. 
We're irreverent <laughs> about the big stuff and totally reverent about the inconsequential <laughs> thing. Right. Um, and you talk a little bit in your book, again, if uh, everyone should pick it up because a lot of this advice that Howard's giving is in this book and will be really helpful to you, um, about acting on the lines. What does that mean? Yeah, they, I, I, I wove that in to intelligent energy. Yeah. Acting on the lines when I said, I'm happy and I'm sad. I'm trying to do what I think the line is telling me to do rather than using the words as clues to the relationship, the circumstance. So when I say the words are not the destination, the words are clues to circumstance. Because rarely do we ever tell the truth, right? How do you know somebody's fallen in love? They deny it. So you've got to look at the totality of the writing to see what's really going on, not just what somebody says. And going back to what you're talking about with, uh, you know, the actors in Jamaica and recalling past events, when a script calls for an actor to share a memory of a past event, um, what other mistakes do you see commonly made here? Yeah, the, the actor tries to step into the memory. When we share a memory, we share it in the present for a reason in the present. We don't try to go to the past. You have to make the memory real for yourself. But then who are you sharing it with and why? It's not about the memory itself. So I don't go into this. It was a cold, gray day. And I stood outside the house with my umbrella. I'm not going into the past. I'm sharing it with you now. Why am I sharing this memory with you now? What's my reason in the present? So memory is not something we try to step into and relive. We're in the present as we share it. And a, a common trap that uh, you see all the time is rushing. What is that and how can I prevent it? <laughs> rushing is a way of hiding. It's a way of saying, don't see me. If I go faster, it'll be better. A filled moment is a short moment. An unfilled moment is a long moment. The faster you go, the longer it will seem because there's no connection to what you're saying. So if I said to you, tell me what a great interview we're having today. I'm really enjoying working with this really terrific. It, because you can't hook into anything I'm saying or feeling, you can't wait for it to be over. Right. So rushing is a way of hiding. An antidote to that, an exercise that you can do, is to read the punctuation out loud and actually take the punctuation. So if it says, comma, I don't want you to do that, period. Why do you do that, question mark? Actually read the punctuation aloud. You're not, as I teach, you're not obligated to the phrasing of that, but it's going to help you breathe and allow each next thought to drop in. We don't run out of breath when we're talking because we breathe as we need to. Actors run out of breath because they see the page in their head and they've got three more sentences to say and they're not done. Yeah. So that's another reason that causes the anxiety and the rushing is because we're not going moment to moment breathing as we need to. So the using the punctuation as an exercise will help you breathe and realize how fast can we talk when we're wanting someone else to follow us. If you are talking that fast, you've lost the reality that you are speaking for a reason. Right, yeah, I think if I'm having that conversation with you and you're talking that fast with me, I'm, I have to stop and think for a second, like what all did you just say? And I just, it, it's just you so- can't, You can't hook in and then you can't wait for it to be over. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have a couple more questions and then, um, that I have for you, and then we have some emailed in questions. So I wanted to talk about um, when I'm doing a part with someone else, um, should I be eye-locking? And what is, what is eye-locking? What does that mean? <laughs> okay, can you, can you find my eyes on the screen? I, I, yeah, I don't know if people can tell, but I'm looking at you, yeah. All right, find only my eyes. Uh -huh. Do not look away, and tell me the favorite trip you took when you were little. I went to Yellowstone National Park. Oh, you looked away. 
Hey, you looked away because you had to contact the image in order to tell the story. Yeah. You understand? We can't think if we're locked onto somebody's eyes. We think in images, not words. And so in order to tell me the story, you'd have to contact the images and then come back to me. However, if you're an actor and you've memorized the scene and I ask you that question, you can lock directly onto my eyes. It's a bad acting habit to think, I don't really mean it unless I lock onto somebody's <laughs> eyes. That's bad acting. When I was a kid, they had the old medical dramas on, medical center with God <laughs> rest him, Chad Everett. And they would stand in the room, staring into each other's eyes and try to emote at each other. And it was bad acting. Years later, along comes ER, and people are always coming from somewhere and going somewhere. So life and death is happening in the middle of living. We have the most profound conversations of our lives over dinner, cleaning up, getting ready to go somewhere, coming home from somewhere. And so very importantly, as actors, the body has to be oriented and alive and not just stiffly standing there trying to stare into somebody's eyes and emote at them. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I hear constantly from casting directors is, uh, in terms of a problem, is actors not reading. So to go on with that, can you talk about listening, um, specifically not listening? Yes. Well, first of all, listening is an active process. Acting teachers have forever told people they've got to listen more. And the poor actor tries to grow their ears so that they can really take it in. You have to remember listening. We listen with speculation and expectation. If I said to you, Tommy, uh, we're getting a guest in a few minutes, you would form a speculation and an expectation of who you think that is. And then I tell you, and she's really very smart. Now you learn that it's female. And for a four-year-old, quite precocious. So every step of the way, chances are you didn't have an image of a four-year-old when I started. Now we've run the scene 10 times. I, I tell you a guest is coming, you're already picturing the four-year-old. So how do you keep that alive? You have to have expectations and speculations as you did the first time, different than what I'm going to say. And allow yourself moment to moment to let the information drop in. So listening is an animated process. We don't listen neutrally. We listen with speculation and expectation of where we think things are heading. That's great. So uh, all those things are things to keep in mind. Um, so when you go on your next audition, you can ask yourself, did I do these things or did I not? In absence of you know casting director feedback, and, and I think that that will really help you as you continue your, your craft and hopefully get out into real audition room sooner than later. Um, had a couple questions come in, so I wanted to ask sure. you these. These are questions for I'd you. I'd love to hear from the audience. So first question emailed in was from Brad. Sorry, this is uh, small for those looking at it, but Brad asked, for those who have been trained in theater, what detailed adjustments would you suggest for actors to translate to the screen for better close-up work? Okay. First of all, Theater is not a bad word. Who do we see at Oscar time? But people <coughs> who came from the theater. So please know that it's a good thing. One of my students, Austin Butler, just did Iceman Cometh on Broadway opposite Denzel Washington. And what a great and amazing experience. And it was Iceman Cometh that opened the door for Quentin Tarantino to cast him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And then I worked with him on his audition and he booked the role of Elvis opposite Tom Hanks as Colonel Tom Parker. And that's the game change. And what was the audition material for Elvis? Tennessee Williams' Orpheus Descending. That was the audition material that Baz Luhrmann used for casting it. So theater is a good thing. Good acting on stage is good acting on film. Bad acting is worse on film because the camera is closer and it will magnify if you are artificial. So you've got to think of the camera as an x-ray. It's a space. Not all theater is the same. 
if you do theater in a giant theater, 3,000 seat, that's a bigger space. If you do theater in a 40 seat equity waiver house, that's already at the television and film level. So you have to think of the camera as a space and we adjust to the space that we're in all the time. So if you're in a long shot, it's a bigger space. A medium shot, smaller. A close up or an extreme close up, very small. As human beings, we adjust all the time. So think when you're in an intimate space, it's going to take a bit less to communicate. You don't need that much. So it's that adjustment to the space you are in that will cause your adjustment as a human being, which will give them what they want. So it's not a matter of being bigger or smaller because you've got to be fully alive and cooking. But if somebody's standing right next to me, I don't have to yell to communicate to them. They're right there. Right. So just think of it as an adjustment to space and realize you do that as human being all the time. That's great. Um, Ali asked, uh, I get so nervous about 10 minutes before my audition, no matter how prepared I am, how can I overcome this? Okay, I wrote a whole chapter on nerves because I understand that. Okay. I live with nerves and I think a lot of people are sensitive, shy, and then we choose this profession where we have to go on. I was nervous before the interview today. It's natural and normal to be nervous. So first of all, don't think of it as a bad thing. Try to talk to yourself and change the word nerves into excitement, excited. And just talk to yourself in a positive way. I'm not, I'm nervous, I'm excited. Okay, that's human, that's real. An actor usually gives three auditions, one on the way, one there, and one on the way home. Usually the one on the way home is the best of the three. <laughs> so it's what you're feeding yourself with before you go in. Why is the one on the way home the best? Because I'm not trying to prove anything. So get rid of the thought of even auditioning. You can never use your acting to prove that you can act. If you go in wanting to prove something, you're going to get self-conscious, you're going to get tight. You have to do the work because you love doing the work. So think, I'm going to go in there. I'm not going to try to prove something. I'm not going to try to impress. I'm going to go in with ease. I'm going to work under pressure as if there is no pressure at all. I'm going to have a ball because I love to act. And I'm going to play this role for a few minutes today. Think I'm hired and I'm going to play the part. And I'm going to enjoy every moment of that. And start talking to yourself about that. As you prepare to do the scene, give yourself the attention on the scene, not on yourself. So who am I? Where am I? Who am I talking to? What do I want? And then let it happen. But more than anything, you have to make a decision that this is going to be enjoyable, that you're not trying to prove anything to anyone, that you love acting, and that is why you're going in on that audition. You're going in to have a ball and do your work. No, that's, um, that's great. And just know that you're going to be nervous and be aware of that, that you know, before every audition, you'll probably be a little bit nervous but also the casting director is bringing you in because they want to see you and um, they think that you might be the right fit for that role. So go in there with that mentality as well and just have fun with it. That's exactly right. And they're probably nervous too. They're hoping <laughs> that they're going to find the right person. And then the director is hoping that they're going to give the right direction. And everybody is. Everybody's a human being. But we tend to think that being nervous is a bad thing. And I want you to self-coach. It's not a bad thing. The only people who don't get nervous at all either don't care or don't understand. I was just going to say, it means that you care. It means you, you, you know, give a crap. For yeah, And if, if we stop getting nervous, it means we stop caring. Right. But we have to start giving ourselves pos positive information rather than negative about being nervous. Being nervous means you're human. <laughs> okay? I can't say who this is. One of my students, and this person is an international superstar, you would know the name, singer. She throws up before every performance. 
And th this is somebody who's legendary. Crazy. Um, Still to this day. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so don't think it's nerves are just left for certain people or that you get over them. But we learn to, to work with it. Yep. So this is a timely question from Rich. What specifically should actors be doing while hunkered down, I like that, uh, to put themselves in a solid position when we're back? Uh, there you are. Uh, boy, aren't we all looking at that. <laughs> I would start with journaling every bit of your experience. What everybody is going through now are going to be turned into stories at some point. So whether you use that for your own emotional inventory of what you're feeling, or you actually create a script from it, journal. That will help get some of it out, at least. Because we're all having a moment in history that will be one of those times that stories are told about forever. We're at, the, we're at an inflection point. So that's one thing you can do. Great time to be reading as much as you can. Work your mind. If you have money where you can afford it, there are courses online that you can take to keep yourself in shape. Uh, Uta Hagen created a series of called The Object Exercises in her book, Challenge for the Actor. She created the object exercises for actors to stay in shape in between acting gigs. So you might get a copy of a challenge for the actor and start working the object exercises. So anything that you can do that helps you grow whether you pay for that or you work it on your own and see what you can do with your own stillness, meditation, focus, tons of free guided meditation things on the internet that you can do. So we, we can still use this time in some way to grow so that when the world returns, and I, I hope it does. <laughs> it will. Our, our, well, you know something, actors, when people make fun of acting as a profession, what would anybody be doing right now in the quarantine if they didn't have entertainment? The arts are vital. Right. So just know that, everybody. The arts are vital. You took away somebody's television, their music, their art, their books, and what do you have? So that's what's getting a lot of people through right now. It's the very thing that we do. Yeah. You're important. Remember that. Um, so now we are going to take some questions from the audience. So I'll go through and, uh, yeah, pick some out and we'll, uh, ask you some more questions. So we have Nikki who asked, what about when you are auditioning and may not be getting much from the reader? So yeah, that is, that, it, that can be common. I always go back to Tom Hanks in the movie Castaway, playing opposite of volleyball. And he made the volleyball so important to him that when he lost Wilson, I cried. And I think, did he complain about a scene partner? I'm not getting anything from the volleyball. Sometimes you're going to be opposite a piece of tape. That happens, right? Somebody has left and now it's your close up and there's no one there. The best are two strong actors. That's going to be the best. That's always the best. But when you don't have a strong reader, you can still make that person so specific that you become vulnerable to what they say to you, even if there's no force behind it. So if you're opposite a, a flat reader and they say to you, I don't love you, if I know who you are to me and you said that you don't love me, it still can move me. So it's not the best, and you can't try to force it to compensate for what they're not doing because you'll end up indicating, but you can endow them in the same way that Tom Hanks endowed a volleyball and made it his best friend. You can endow them enough so that it can still play as a scene. But the best are two strong actors, obviously. <laughs> Doesn't always happen, but that's, good. No. that's great advice. Um, so Brian was wondering, how do you find the good and kindness in yourself if you're playing a horrible character? So we talked- get rid of the word. <laughs> you can't see your character's horrible. You're already judging, right? You have got to see yourself. Forrest Whitaker is Idi Amin. 
right? I'm doing good. You can't see it as horrible. If you see it as horrible, you've judged the character. I have a friend who's a noted author and rabbi, Joseph Telushkin, and he said, we judge ourselves by our intentions and others by their actions. So we feel justified in everything we do, but I judge your actions. When you pick up a script, you see the actions of the character and you go, oh no, that's terrible. Look at what Brian Cranston does as that yeah. character, Heisenberg yeah. in Breaking Bad. Look at his actions. They're horrible actions done by a person who means well and is trying the best for, that he can given his circumstance. So it takes no talent to judge, you have to justify. The minute you judge your character as bad, you're going separate. Because have we all done things somebody else might consider bad? I tell somebody off and I think, good for me. I stood up for myself. And the other guy thinks, what a jerk. Right. So you have to supply the intentions and justify the actions. That's genius level acting. It's not genius to judge and go, oh, I wouldn't do that. That's not me. That's terrible. That's a bad guy. That takes no talent. Right. Your talent comes in when you see the human being. And it's more challenging because you, could, you might be playing a character that does things that disgust you. But you better see that person as a good person. The late C Philip Seymour Hoffman in doubt. If you judge the character, you're sunk. So justify, don't judge. Get rid of those types of judgments. And you know, it's our failing. Our failing as actors, as artists, is our failing as human beings. We fail to see other people's lives as real as our own. You've got to be able to pick up a character and see a dimensional human being and see yourself. Isn't it the root of all prejudice not to be able to see yourself in other human beings? Actors do not make that mistake. When you pick up a script, you better see yourself in every role. It's great. Um, Sean said, I feel typecast priests. I like playing them, but crave a serial killer role or similar. But should I just play my strength? Um, there's a lot of me as a person uh, in the priest and other similar roles. Yeah, and sometimes it's the priest who ends up being the serial killer. Writers love to do that. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it is so much about having access to every part of you. One, it's good that your cast is anything. So that's, that's good news. Because yeah. anytime you book a job, that's fantastic. But you have to fully own the full range of your behaviors. I had a student go in in the morning for a stay-at-home dad. And he wore a flannel shirt and dad jeans. And he connected himself to it. He booked it. And that afternoon for a mafia don. He had the suit jacket slung over his shoulders, carried himself completely differently and brought out a different part of himself. He got both roles and in both situations, he is the character, but you have to own it. When I worked with Michael Chiklis on his audition for The Shield and later on the role, and, and Michael won the Emmy eventually for that, he had done the commish and everybody thought, oh, he's sweet and cuddly. And so we talked about it, and what he did is he shaved his head totally. He worked on where that character lived inside him. And he went in, he was perfectly nice when he went in, but he had an edge that no one expected to see. And suddenly he gets cast as that, and then they see him as that, and then you have to go back the other way again. It's just the life of an actor. But every role exists inside us somewhere. I just like this question. Kaz asked, will AI put us out of business, Howard? I hope not. <laughs> I don't know, we might all be. I, I wanna say this, that's why I'm so against pre-shaping and pre-planning, which leads to robotic acting. Right. right now, what compels attention is the very variable of human expression. Our very aliveness makes people watch. They haven't figured out how to mimic that yet. They want to, they want to take all of our jobs away, but they can't do it. So actors don't contribute by being robotic in your acting, by pre-shaping and pre-planning. Learn to be moment to moment and so alive 
that no computer generated anything could compete with us, including AI. But yes, it's on my mind. I've thought about it. <laughs> That's uh, yeah. I think there's always going to, you know, be a need for actors. It goes back to you know that. Let's hope. <laughs> Let's hope Who knows? You know. That's uh, Who knows? oh boy. Um, let's see. There are so many good questions. Thanks again, everybody, for uh, bringing these questions in. I will take a moment and, and mention. I want to mention this now before we end that um, Howard is doing online courses. Um, so you can take uh, those courses online. Um, the, and then also for our friends from Australia, who I, I believe are, are watching now, um, there's also uh, classes for them as well. And Howard, you could probably talk about it better than I can. Yeah, I'll help. I'll help. Yeah, help me out I here. I don't want to jump into a pitch. For me. <laughs> yeah, help me out here a little I bit. have a studio in Australia as well, and they are offering courses through the Australian studio. And we do here. We're calling it Fine Online. And thank you, Ian and Becky, my administrators. On May 7th at 2 p.m., May 7th at 2 p.m., I'll be doing the Eight Steps Lecture. And that'll be on Zoom worldwide. So if you go to our website, howardfine.com, you can find the information if anybody wants to hear the three-hour lecture. It's got these elements, but much more examples and a lot more detail. Great. Vivian. End of self-promotion. <laughs> <laughs> you did a lot better than I did. Um, <laughs> Viviana asked... Uh, I would like to know how to quickly get into character. It usually takes me time. So when I have a day to prepare, I never feel ready. It actually is a sign that the preparation is incorrect. First of all, we never feel ready. Trust me, the swimmers on the starting block in the Olympics, when they pull the starting pistol, would love to say, hey, give me 10 minutes more. You have to learn three questions to ask yourself. What did I just do? What am I doing right now? What's the first thing I want? Think about this. One of Hagen's exercises is three phone conversations with three people that bring out different roles that you play in your own life. And think everybody how many roles we play in the course of a day. Many. Teacher, student, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, brother, sister, uh, confidant, enemy. So you put three conversations together and think it can happen in life that you're on the phone with your romantic partner. You're having the most intimate conversation and then somebody beeps in and it's a telemarketer and you go from, honey, uh-huh, oh, hang on. Yes, this is he. No, not interest. no, not interest. thank you. Hi, sweetie. We don't need a half an hour to make that shift. If you ever do a one person show, you're gonna be going from character to character to character. The reason we want more time is to set ourselves into more control. If I have more time, I will really be in my head. It's akin to going to the beach. Don't we all know that it doesn't work to stick your big toe in and try to warm up? We know at some point we have to dive in brace ourselves and deal with it. And it's the same with preparation. We think we need so much more time to throw ourselves in. Now that doesn't mean there isn't homework to be done. Step number one of my eight steps is who am I? If you've got time to do the research and the homework to fully prepare, that's the best. If you don't, it's harder, but you can still know, and I'll allude to this when I give my lecture, how to touch the eight steps quickly when you have to work for television and film or an audition that's coming up the next day. So in preparation, in terms of the homework that you wanna do, that's totally understandable. But most of the time, throwing ourselves in is something we have to learn to do. Patrick asked, how do you teach stillness, especially for television? Well, one, our life habits are our acting habits. I had a student once, thank God he's, he's left acting. He was <laughs> never still. Everything was moving all the time. Yeah, I know. And I suggest ballet. I suggest yoga. I suggest the Alexander technique, meditation. But he said to me, but I don't do it when I act. 
<laughs> which was untrue, right? If that mm. is your issue, it is your issue. And of course, it was very pronounced when he was acting. So we very often have to learn to be still. When you can make yourself still for periods of a time, what you do will be by choice rather than habit. If you can never make yourself still, you will not be able to make yourself still as an actor. So the tough thing about being an actor is it's your mind, your body, your voice, your soul, and you have to work every aspect of yourself in order to be able to work the way you want to work. So stillness is a big one, but it's something I wish everybody would work on on their own. As I said, dance classes, Alexander technique, yoga, martial arts, anything that's going to be about centering, finding your core, and yes, the power of stillness. It's part of my foundation. Question that's coming up now is, should you get into character for a one-liner? I've been told that you can overact by trying to. Yeah, yes, well, we can try to make too much <laughs> out of a one line. So you can't try to be the, try to show them everything you can do <laughs> on it's over there is your line. Right? What are you going to do with that? Right. But you should do your work. I think of the movie When Harry Met Sally. One character in it had one line, which is the most memorable line in the movie. I'll have what she's having. And in that moment, you know who she was and what she wanted. <laughs> yeah. It was all clear. So, but I would say the, the best advice is that it has to be easy, effortless. If we see you trying to act, whether you've got a small role or a big role, you're in trouble. It's got to be easy and effortless. And um, one thing that I, I got emailed in, in in a number of different ways um, that I wanted to talk to you about as we end here um, is how do I know that I, I like acting, but how do I know that this should be my profession? Um, you know, I, I get people asking, I've been doing this for X amount of years and I don't book or like I've, you know, I go on a lot of auditions, I call back, maybe they're doing it as a hobby, which is fine, but just how do I know that this is the right profession for me? Well, I would check in with this. If anything else makes you happy, do that. Because this is not a rational career choice. This is a passionate and emotional one. So if you have passion for it, this is what you love to do, then don't take no for an answer. But if it's a casual interest and there are a lot of other things that you might enjoy, this is a tough career. Everybody knows that. So it has to be for the people that feel passionate about it. I would ask you, have you ever been cast? It doesn't have to be a professional project. It could be a community theater. It could be a student project or a student film. Have you ever been the one that auditioned and got chosen? Because you have to look at that and think, am I getting some reinforcement from anyone who doesn't know me, who thinks, boy, he or she, that's the person I want to hire for this. So again, it doesn't even have to be a paying gig. What, what feedback are you getting? If you are taking classes, what are you hearing from your teachers in terms of how they value your work? How is your work comparing with others? But more than anything, you got to check in with yourself. Is this my love? Is this, can I live without this? And if you can live without it, you have your answer. If you can't live without it, then that's the answer too. It's your passion, it's your calling. And then don't take no. Great advice. Well, we are out of time. So wanted to thank you, Howard, for uh, giving us all this great advice. Uh, if there's, I don't know if there's anything else that you want to mention before we sign off, uh, but I had a wonderful time. We had a lot of people, a lot of great questions. Uh, thank you so much for doing that this with us thank you it was my pleasure and everybody stay safe stay well this is a tough time in the world so sending much love out there and light to everyone thank you we'll get through it thanks everyone and i'll see you next time